Hello, everyone, and welcome to the anchor session of CME Palooza Fall. Uh, my name is Scott Kober. I am one of the co-producers of CME Palooza, um, and I would like to welcome you to this session entitled Game, Set, and Match Clinician Learning Styles Across the Generations. This session is sponsored by Hippocrates, Platform Q, and Catamount Medical Education. Um, this is the ninth year of CME Palooza, and this is actually the first session that I will be moderating myself. Um, so kind of doing double duty, doing the moderating on the front end, doing some of the production work on the back end, keeping an eye on some of the questions um, that are coming in. So as we do with all of our CME Palooza sessions, um, I am going to start things out by thanking all of our sponsors, our gold sponsors, Daiichi Sankyo, Med Learning Group, Physician Education Resource, our silver sponsors, Academy for Continued Healthcare Learning, Academic CME, Antidote Education Company, Catamount Medical Education, DKB Med, Hippocrates, Helio CME, Integrity CE, Medscape Education, Platform Q Health Education, Prova Education, Red Med Ed, and Vindico Medical Education. And then our many bronze sponsors, Answers in CME, AxDev, Onum Continuing Education, Creative Educational Concepts, <coughs> Epidemiology, Excalibur Medical Education, Global Education Group, Infograph Ed, Med IQ, Partners for Advancing Clinical Education, Paradigm Medical Communications, Postgraduate Institute for Medicine, PrimeMed, PBI, RMEI Medical Education, and Wright Medicine. Um, certainly, I'd like to get, also give a special shout out to Tail and Health, who sponsored the CME Palooza Spectacular Challenge last week. So there are three ways to ask questions during this and all of our CME Palooza sessions. You can use the CME Outfitters text line to send in a question. Phone number is 267-666-0CME-0263. Or you can tweet your question to us using the CME Palooza hashtag. Um, and for those folks who are watching this in YouTube, um, you can click on the watch on YouTube on the lower left-hand corner of our live screen. You can enter in questions without, within the YouTube chat functions. We'll get to as many questions as we can during this session. So we will be incorporating audience response questions during this presentation as we do with all of our presentations uh, using Poll Everywhere. So thanks to Broadcast Beat Studios, our sponsor of our ARS system. You can either download the Poll Everywhere app and join the presentation entitled CME Palooza 005, or type in the following URL in a web browser, www.pollev.com backslash CME Palooza 005. So please note that the opinions, discussions, and or conclusions expressed are those of our panelists and do not represent an endorsement by or a position of their employer, its parent company, or their affiliates. So I'm going to let our panelists introduce themselves here in a minute. Um, this is a session I actually had in, have had in mind for a few years. Um, for whatever reason, there are a lot of physicians who play um, in some of the tennis leagues I play in. So these are three of the three of the guys I play with regularly. I've known all of them for for a while. Um, so we're friends on and off the court. And I thought it'd be interesting to kind of get them together. Um, you know, we deal with a lot of key opinion leaders, subject matter experts. Um, and these are just really three, three of the of our people in sort of our general target audience. Um, so I thought it'd be interesting to get their perspective on um, the role of CME in their career and in um, of their educational background in general. But before we start and we, before we meet our three panelists, um, there's a few ARS questions I want to throw at people. So um, if you get out um, your phone, your devices, um, and you can answer a few of these questions. So here's our first question. When was the last time you personally talked to your healthcare provider, friends or family? So not your healthcare provider, but friends or family that are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, et cetera, about their opinions on CME. Within the last week, within the last month, within the last year, I don't exactly remember, but it came up at some point or never. <clears throat> All right. So I don't. So it's interesting that what we do on a day-to-day -day basis, um, a lot of us don't really talk to the people we know um, about what we do um, and about how they um, 
uh, take in and um, utilize some of the work that we do. You see 43% um, have never talked to people in their family who are doctors, nurses, pharmacists, et cetera, um, about their opinions on CD. So interesting. Okay, next question. What do you call a tennis serve that hits the net before successfully dropping into the service box? So this is a tennis question to see how well people know their tennis. I know there's a couple of tennis players in the CME community, but probably not that many. So your questions are a do-over, a clipper, a let, or a fault. Give people another few questions to answer this one. All right. Obviously not a lot of tennis players out there. The correct answer is C, a let. A fault is when the ball goes into the net or does not land in the service box. Okay. So with that, I am going to um, introduce, have our three panelists introduce themselves, uh, age before beauty. Uh, so I am going to let uh, Neeraj in introduce himself first, and maybe you can just kind of uh, talk about your medical school training, your residency, and sort of your, um, your practice background. So I'm a neurologist by training, trained up in New York, uh, did my neuroimaging in the University of Buffalo and a stroke fellowship at the uh, University of Texas. I practice uh, now mostly uh, neurology and imaging in uh, Pottsville, uh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I've been around the block for a number of years. So uh, I'm 56 and I play a lot of tennis. Okay. All right, Jeff. Yeah, I'm Jeff Ware. I'm an assistant professor in radiology at Penn, um, and I'm a specialist in neuroradiology. Um, I did my medical school at Columbia University in New York City, and then I came to Philadelphia to do radiology residency at Penn, and I stayed on to do two more years of neuroradiology fellowship. Uh, and I've been on the faculty now for a couple of years. I believe this is my fourth year. Uh, I do about 50% 50 of my practice roughly is clinical radiology, and the other half is research. I have a research focus in traumatic brain injury and other applications of quantitative MRI. So uh, half and half clinical research. Um, and yeah, and also, you know, spend a lot of time teaching residents, fellows, and to a lesser degree, medical students. Okay. Abe? Uh, hey, I'm Abe. I'm a second year medical student at Drexel. Um, obviously not trained in anything, don't have a residency in anything. Also don't use continuing medical education at the moment, but that's me. Okay. So in addition to being uh, very intelligent people, these are all very good tennis players. So let the record show. Here is my singles record over the course of the last five or six years against these three gentlemen the combined record of three and 17. So as we know from working in uh, continuing medical education, when you go, go it on your own for projects, you often end up looking like this. So this is me after one of our recent matches. But when you partner with the right organizations, um, obviously your programs look a lot better. So here is my doubles record playing with these three gentlemen. Uh, undefeated. So 9-0 and over the course of the last two or three years. Um, and uh, here, here, here I am celebrating one of our recent victories. Obviously, I am the one on the left jumping much, much higher. Okay. Um, okay. So with that, we're going to kind of get into kind of the crux of the discussion. So certainly, as I mentioned, if people have any questions they want to ask, um, feel free to kind of use our various noms. So Neeraj, how would you describe your training in medical school and residency and what teaching methods were particularly effective and ineffective when you were kind of learning to be a doctor? Well, majority of the medical training is self-study and, um, and being attentive. And um, so I paid a lot of attention while I was training and the rest of the time I was goofing around. <laughs> So there's a lot of discipline and self-studying involved in medicine. And CMEs were always very useful during the training in the latter part of my career, uh, particularly once I came into practice, private practice. OK, how about you, Jeff? Um, when you were, I mean, you're, you're not that far out of medical school. Um, so you know, when you kind of look back, you know, kind of what, 
what made you a good doctor and, and kind of what kind of classes or, or techniques do you kind of look back on and say that this was sort of a waste of time? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I went through medical school when there was a big sort of push to transition away from traditional didactic lecture formats as the sort of the the sole method of content delivery towards a lot of these more, I guess, I don't know what they call it now, but flip classroom approaches where it's a little more interactive, a little more dependent on the students participating and whatever you're doing. And I, I, I guess I was kind of skeptical of that at the time, but I, I do think I gravitate a lot more towards the hands-on participatory approaches as opposed to the conventional lecture formats. So since a lot of probably your professors were brand new to it, how were, you know, how effective were they in sort of teaching you kind of with that new style? Yeah, I think there was some hit or miss and probably a lot of the professors who were used to doing things their way for a long time or putting up some resistance to the new, uh, the new methods that were being brought in by, you know, people wanted to change things, make things better. Um, and I think there's some hit or miss, but I mean, really, to the extent that you can get the students engaging and participating, it, it it really is a better format than just sitting there and listening to someone talk for half hour, an hour. Okay. So Neeraj, was there any sort of, any any of that when uh, when uh, you were in medical school or was it uh, I went in medical school a long time back. So <laughs> at the time it was all lectures and you had to, you know, it's all, all lectures and self-study. There was a lot of folks in self-study and lectures. Okay. And this is, obviously evolving medical education. Okay. Um, so Abe, how about you? So, so you know, you're in, you're in your second year now. Um, so what are you seeing as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a current medical school student? Yeah, so I would kind of agree with Jeff, like it's fully flipped. Like we don't even have live lectures anymore. All our live sessions are only interactive. So basically everyone kind of learns by themselves for like a couple of days and then we'll have live sessions on like specific topics, which I definitely prefer a lot more because I feel like it's easy and I can do it on my own pace rather than being in a lecture at 8 a.m. when I'm half awake. So I I mean, I definitely appreciate that aspect of it. Okay. So how much classroom time are you actually spending? So we have class for like, I would say two to three hours, three to four times a week, which is why I can play tennis with you guys all the time. <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So I got another question for people uh, before we kind of talk a little bit more about some issues that were probably more relevant to what we do. Okay. Who currently regulates CME requirements and standards for physicians in the United States? Here are your choices. A, each healthcare facility sets their own internal standards. B, each state sets its own unique standards. C, the federal government sets a nationwide standards. Or D, there are no standards for the majority of practicing physicians in the United States. I'm going to try to use as many tennis analogies as I can during the session, by the way. So I'm going to, uh, I got a whole list written down for everyone to kind of count things up. Okay. So, uh, Abe, what do you think the right, what, what do you think the right answer is? Uh, I'm going to go with B, but okay, I have no good. idea. Oh, you're following the herd. The correct answer is B. Each state does set its own unique standards. So we're going to talk a little bit more about that as we're going along. So, so Abe, I'm going to start with you. I'm going to I'm going to volley the first question your way. See that tennis analogy number one with 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 a volley. Um, so, how is new technology incorporated into your current training as a medical student? So again, I'm in the preclinical years, which might be a little different, but we definitely there is a lot of focus on kind of. At least like, we were required to buy an iPad, which is one very different thing than before. Like we're required to bring it to class. We take our tests on it. Everything is kind of using that. And then other than that, like I feel like just having everything available to me at all times is really nice. Like I can be sitting on the subway and like watching a lecture rather than like having to be in class or something. So I would say like that's one way that it's definitely benefited me. And so are you watching a lot of videos? Like like is there any like interactive stuff going on? Um. I would say there's less technology interactive stuff. Like there's definitely some, like I'm at this part of my education where I'm like studying for step one. So like there's USMLE practice questions, which I also do a lot of. So those are kind of a little interactive, but I, I wouldn't say there's that much like 
interactive technology being used to teach us per se. Okay. So when you're in the classroom two to three hours a week, is it mostly just the, the your your professors kind of lecturing to you and not necessarily kind of doing things? On um, it, it'll just be like they'll they'll throw out some questions and we're, we're, we're in like a table of five or six people and we're just talking about them amongst ourselves and come up with answers based on what okay. we think. And then we have like a little lecture after that about what is the right answer. Okay. So do you ever kind of think to yourself that there there's got to be a better way to do this or or do you think that, that that's kind of being, being done okay? Um. I kind of like it. I think it's been. I, I think it's being done reasonably well. I, I don't. I don't see a way t that technology could really benefit that. Maybe with uh, we do like simulations with like practice patients. I think there, we have like a practice or like a patient that's like not really alive, but it's like a sim body that like has a heart attack or has like these things. So there, it's definitely a little more incorporated, and I kind of like that. I could see maybe like VR or something could be cool for something like that, but I don't okay. know. Okay. Um, so Jeff, you said that, you know, you've been teaching for the last couple of years. Um, how much do you kind of incorporate technology into your classes? Yeah, I mean, the teaching that I do is very clinical on the job type teaching. I mean, it's residents and fellows, you know, participating in patient care rather than classroom based settings. You know, I give maybe one or two classes in a classroom a year. Um, but when I do, you know, we use a lot of interactive formats. We try to get the, you know, we break up into groups. We try to answer questions. We bring it back to the larger group. Um, and electronic formats are used to sort of facilitate that. Like they use an iPad. We can collate the answers. We can show polling results. We use poll everywhere a lot when we're giving lectures uh, to the residents or fellows. Um, so it, it makes its way in there. Okay. So Avi, what has been your best educational experience so far? In terms of with technology or just in general? Just in general, like 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 what do you like what do you look back on your last year and a half, two years, say, wow, this is the one, this is the class that I really learned a lot and this is why. Um, well, we don't really have specific classes, but I would in general, I think the concept of just having, I think I kind of talked about this earlier, just having like lectures available whenever and wherever is really nice. Just to be able to kind of access them whenever I choose, like. I can wake up really early at like six or study them or I can stay up late and study them. And it's not like a, there's no access issue for me to like access any of the education that I want. It's always there. And it's just like on me to kind of get on it, which I really like. Okay. Um, so how prepared do you feel, Abe, to kind of, you know, eventually become a doctor at this point? Um, right now, woefully unprepared. Do not trust me with any medical decisions in your life, but hopefully that'll come. Um, I feel like the first two like preclinical years, I feel like it's hard to assess what preparation you have to be a doctor because you're not like, you kind of have to be thrown out there a little bit. But in terms of what I have to do, because I have to like, the goal of this year is to kind of pass step one and like do well on it. And I think I'm like pretty set up to do well on that. Okay. Neeraj, at what point in kind of your training did, uh, did you kind of come to the realization that, you know, hey, I, I think that I sort of might know enough that I can actually do this? Yeah, in medicine, you never know enough. So it's a constant learning process. And uh, there are times, you, you know, I've been in practice for nearly about 20 plus years. And there's times you'll see cases or you'll see patients which will still baffle you. I asked young, smart doctors like Jeff the other day, I was doing a consultation about the MRI finding in diabetic ketoacidosis. So, yeah, it's a constant learning process. And uh, we always try and uh, engage them. Um, smart people around us so we learn more. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit now about sort of your uh, kind of your utilization of actually of, of CME in your practices. Um, but before we do, I do have another audience response question for everybody. Okay. What are the current CME requirements for physicians practicing in Pennsylvania? So here are your choices. At least 50 hours of CME credits annually, all of which must be AMA PRA category one credit hours at least 100 hours of CME credits per licensure cycle, including at least 20 AMA PRA category one credit hours, at least 150 hours of CME credit per licensure cycle with no requirement that any be AMA PRA category one credit hours, or the state of Pennsylvania does not have a number of required CME credit hours for physician license renewal. I don't expect many people in our audience to actually know the answer to this. So hopefully they will take somewhat of an educated guess. I will tell you 
that uh, each of these four are correct answers for at least one state in the United States. So every state does have different licensure requirements. Um, and um, one of these is the correct answer for Pennsylvania. All right, looks like a lot of people are choosing B. Jeff, what do you think? Well, my institution has been hounding me recently to get this uh, <laughs> taken care of. So I, I'm, uh, I should know, and I believe it is 100. The Jeff, correct, you're wrong, 50. The correct answer is B, 100 hours of CME yeah. credit really? per cycle, including at least 20 AMA PRA category one credit hours. Yeah. To renew your license, it's 40, uh, 40 hours uh, every two, two years. If you go to the state, this is said. This is what it says: 100 hours, 20 hours of, of Category One credit. Well, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> so get to work, New York, apparently. Okay. Oh, and so here, here are the answers. I didn't show it up on the screen. Yeah. Here are the answers as they came in. Okay. Um, so, Jeff, when you became a licensed physician, were you aware that Pennsylvania had CE requirements and did you have any idea what they were going to be? Did you know what C what what CM even was? Yeah, I knew. Well, I had heard of it before because when you go to the conferences and you're presenting your research and stuff like that, you you hear everyone being like, "Oh, this is CME credit. You can get credit for this." And when you're a trainee, you don't care, but you at least hear it over and over and over again. Um, so I knew that there was a requirement. I can't say that I knew exactly what that requirement was when I became an attending, but my sense was that, you know, it was at least there. Okay. Um, so Neeraj, you know, you've been in practice now for the better part of two decades, two plus decades. Um, what is typically your approach to fulfilling your CME requirements? So we rely, I mostly rely on online CMEs and attending some of the national meetings. So I'm kind of academically involved in a um, number of meetings. Uh, so I get a bunch of my CMEs from attending national meetings and the rest um, through online CMEs. Okay. So then how do you decide, I mean, the national meetings, I assume you just go to, you know, like the American Academy of Neurology or something like that. Um, but how do you decide when, you know, when you're kind of going on, you know, to figure out on, an online CME program, how do you decide, you know, what, which ones you're going to go through, which ones you're going to take. So I'm mostly interested in stroke and imaging. So I tend to gravitate to its, those online um, meetings. And um, and then nationally, um, I, I was a founder member of one of these societies in neuroimaging. So I tend to go to that meeting quite a bit and, uh, and a lot of stroke meetings. OK. Um, so in your opinion, is CME a good thing? A nuisance, a little of both? I think it's a good thing, to be honest. It's a good thing. The mandatory requirement is a bad thing, but the the rest is a good thing. Okay. So 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 talk to me about, you know, maybe one experience in the last 10 years where you know you said this is something that I really want to learn about. Um, and how you exactly kind of went about, you know, kind of learning it. So when you're in private practice, uh, fortunately, I have a clinical professorship at a local medical school. Uh, when you're in uh, clinical practice on your own, you constantly have to know new things. And um, I get majority of my share from going to lectures or giving lectures or having medical students and neurology residents rotate through our office and it keeps me um, uh, on my toes. Okay. Um, how about you, Jeff? I'm going to ask you some of the same questions. Um, you know, how do you sort of approach your uh, fulfilling your, your 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 CME requirements? Yeah, I usually just tack it on to the meetings that I would attend otherwise, whether they be society meetings or meetings that are specifically geared towards the research areas that I'm involved in. Um, we also give some CME courses ourselves, and so I sometimes we'll just do some of those as well. Um, but yeah, between those two is probably how I get pretty much all of it. Okay, so you said that your institution is hounding you to complete your credits. So let's say you've got probably until the end of the year, let's say. Um, yeah. So, you know, 
how would you go about doing that? I would, you know, I would, if I'm attending a meeting, I will make a note to actually like pay attention to the CME and do the CME to get the requirements. That's usually how I do it. I haven't ever, I don't think I've ever done any online stuff. Um, but if I was really in a pinch, like, I think I'm not even child be, abuse. Well, you have to do child. the child abuse and the opioid ones that are more specific, but in terms of the vast majority of the credits, um, yeah, I would, you know, if I was really in a pinch, then you could do it online, but I've been successful just doing it all through meetings so far. Okay. Um, so then Neeraj, would you say that you're a better physician now than you were five years ago? That's all subjective. I like to think I am. <laughs> okay. Yeah, because, you know, you tend to, there's a lot of stuff which comes around in medicine, particularly in um, imaging and stroke. There's a lot of new stuff all the time from what, when I trained and when I became a doctor to what it is now, it's a, it's a total game changer. Okay. So Jeff, what do you do when you have, you know, a situation or a problem, you know, with a patient case that you can't figure out or that you need somebody else to weigh in on? Yeah. I mean, I might ask one of my colleagues who's more senior, more experienced first off. Um, I will consult the literature, uh, look for relevant articles that you know, describe the problem or some you know, strange association of findings with a disease process that I'm not thinking of, something like that. Um, those are probably the most common approaches that I use. Okay. Um, so in your mind is CME good, bad, a new sense, a little of both? I think it's a little of both. I mean, I think everyone sees the requirement as kind of annoying. I think most people want to learn and want to participate in things that are CME, um, and just have it come naturally. Uh, so, you know, it becomes a little bit of an annoyance as well, okay. but I think, you know, I agree with the spirit of CME for sure. Okay. So if you see something that is like a meeting that is CME accredited versus a meeting that is not CME accredited, does that make any difference to you? To me, no. Neeraj? I gravitate towards more CME oriented meetings. Why? It's, I think they're more um, inclusive of what's, what's really being published and what's really new and upcoming. Okay. Okay. Um, Okay, so just a reminder to people, if you have questions, please text them in. Um, we have uh, another polling question, and then I'm going to get Abe back into the discussion. All right, hold on here. There we go. Our next question is, okay. Your garbage disposal is jammed and you don't know how to unclog it. What do you do? A, call someone who is handy and ask them for advice. B, search for a do-it-yourself video on YouTube. C, read up on possible solutions online. D, call a plumber. Or E, stop using the sink for a week or two until someone else in the house takes care of it. All right, the plumbers out there aren't going to be very happy about this. Okay, majority of people are saying that they're gonna search for a do-it-yourself video on YouTube. Lots, some other people are saying they're read up on possible solutions online. All right, so let me throw this at you, Abe. Um, it doesn't have to be this particular situation. So you, you're, you know, you've got a something that you have to learn. You know, something is broken. Something you, you have to learn how to do. Um, <coughs> now, how are where where do you go first? I think for general life, YouTube for sure. Just quickly to. Especially if it's something I think that can be relatively easy, I would like just either Google it or like look up a YouTube video on how to do something like that. And if that doesn't work, then I would ask somebody or call a plumber or something, the equivalent of that, whatever problem. Okay, so give me, give me a recent example where you had, you know, sort of a, a you know, a situation like this that you had to, to kind of uh, figure out. Um, I crashed my bike and the handlebar was belt bent in and i looked up a video and they said i should hit it with a hammer a few times but that did not work super well and then i went to a bike shop and they charged me 300 dollars, which wasn't great but it was fixed okay uh jeff how about you when you kind of need when you have personal problems like this that 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 need to be figured out what where do you go 
I, I go to YouTube as well. I find that very helpful, especially for around the house type stuff. Okay. Neeraj, same? Ditto. Garage of that. All right. How about professional problems then? Um, would you guys ever go to YouTube to try to, you know, do, you know, to kind of figure out um, an issue that's, you know, something you're having an issue with professionally? Neeraj? I've never been on YouTube for professional opinions. Okay. But that's a good idea. I mean, I'm something to... I just yeah, don't think that, I don't think the type of content is really there okay. uh, for the very specific and uh, things that we would be trying to look into. I do go to Dr. Google sometimes, but that's yeah. Uh, Abe, how about you? Um, you know, when you have to, you know, when you're studying for an exam, will you go to YouTube and sort of find some, you know, study study aids, study guides on there? Not really. I feel like. At least at the point we're at, it's like you have if you know you have to know what to Google to get to the right answer, and it's hard to figure out what to Google. I just have like a group chat with a bunch of my friends, and we'll just like post questions we have in there and see what other people think. And then if nobody gets an answer, we'll email a professor. Okay. Okay. Uh, so what sorts what sorts of things are you talking about in 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 uh, the group chat? It's like mechanisms of like drugs or enzymes. I don't know about like how different drugs affect our body and like why certain things happen because of it. And then usually one of my friends will just know the answer or they'll like link me to a paper that has the answer. Okay. Okay. Um, now Jeff and Neeraj, I know, you know, grand rounds are sort of kind of a staple of a lot of academic medical centers. Um, how much do you guys take advantage, you take advantage of them, attend them, um, especially in the COVID era, I'm sure they kind of went away and I don't know if they're coming back at all um, where, where, where you are, Jeff. Yeah, I mean, we went, they did go away for a little bit, then we went virtual, and now we're back to in person, you know, actually more and hybrid as well. So you can attend, you can attend virtually as well as in person. Um, and so, yeah, I try to attend whenever I can. I mean, the schedule sometimes makes that difficult, but I try. Okay. How about you, Neeraj? I do mostly virtual. Okay. Okay. Um, so when you're, when you're preparing a presentation, um, how much time effort do you guys put into it? Um, how much you kind of just recycle the same materials over and over and how much you kind of, kind of put together new materials kind of, uh, yourself, Jeff. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a little bit variable, but, um, I think, you know, you put a lot of effort in the first time you make the presentation and every, you know, several weeks worth of, of effort, um, to try to really make it something that's. You know, useful and that people will actually listen to and will enjoy and and every year after that you know assuming i'm giving this lecture on a yearly basis i try to update it with whatever i try to actually make a note after immediately after i give the talk as to like what went wrong what would be good to put in and so i know to address those things when i revise it the next year um and so but you know the revision process will be much more brief than the initial uh talk construction Okay. How about you, Neeraj? Exactly the same. I mean, you just kind of tweak your earlier presentations, uh, catch up with what's what's new and greatest, and put it in the slide. Okay. So if you could give, like, you know, obviously we're, we're an audience of people who are who are kind of uh, working with faculty to kind of develop these accredited medical medical education programs. Um, if you could sort of offer one piece of advice that would kind of make your make your world easier, kind of, um, you know, make you know, our activities better for, you know, people like yourselves, um, what would that be? Neeraj, any So thoughts? what catches my attention is something which is brand new, some, some new drugs, some new mechanism of action, new imaging technique for, you know, that's what catches my attention. Run of the mill really doesn't catch my attention so much. Um, so it has to be something which focuses on something which is new, which is being used clinically and uh, it's out of the research phase. So it's more the content, not so much like how it's delivered or like the, any, you know. Yeah, YouTube any... presentations or whatever presentations that, you, you know, something which catches your eye. Obviously your mind is an inquisitive mind. So you tend to look at those uh, presentations much more in depth. Okay, Jeff, how about you? Yeah, I, I would agree that I, I think the content is most important. I think a focus on something that's practical that I can do now 
that I can learn the steps to actually start doing myself to improve my practice or do something new offer a service that's not being done is very attractive, um, especially, you know, to the extent that those things are new and in demand. Okay. Um, do you guys feel that there's typically enough CME out there? I mean, when, when you're looking for things, are you, or is it, is it, you know, are you finding tons of options? There is a lot of CMEs available, but uh, sometimes the content is so di diluted. Um, particularly, I can only talk from a non-academic world. Jeff is an academic world. I only have one foot in the academic world, but as a private practice doctor, you really have to screen a lot of CMEs um, to get the right CMEs. Okay. <clears throat> Jeff, any, any, any yeah, other? Yeah, I mean, I would say that there's a wide availability of CME if your goal is to get the credits under your belt. If the goal is to really get some quality content that helps you really improve what you do, then that's much more rare. Okay, great. All right. Um, well, I know that we have the first pitch of game two coming up here in moments. Um, so um, we, I have not seen any questions come over from our um, Q&A line. So I am going to shut this one down a little bit early. Um, so I want to um, thank the three of you guys for joining me today and certainly thank our CME Palooza audience. Um, few, a few things as we are wrapping this up. Um, please note that there is a survey link at the bottom of the live tab that helps us get a sense of who is watching CME Palooza Fall. It's only a few questions, so please complete it when you can. Um, and for people who do like money, um, we have the CME Palooza scavenger hunt going on right now. Just go to the website of our sponsor, Promotion Broadcast Beat Studios, www.broadcastbeatstudios.com, and look for the CME Palooza logo. Click on it and see what happens. I promise nothing bad will happen. Um, and this is the last session of the day, so you don't need to view the next session. Um, so for those folks who um, are watching us live, uh, thank you once again for joining us today. For those folks watching the enduring sessions, we hope that you have, uh, will go back and watch um, other sessions that have been taking place during the course of today. So with that, I'd like to thank Neeraj and Jeff and Abe for their time today and hope everyone has a good afternoon.